everyone. So in finishing the second half of our lecture on chapter 17, we're going to talk about galvanic cells. These are the cells that you made in lab last week. Galvanic cells. That was where we used the well plate. Remember you had your well plate with all the little wells in it? And you created an anode and a cathode with solutions and these solid surfaces hooked it up to not a light bulb, this was a voltmeter right here. And your salt bridge, we didn't do this kind of salt bridge, this is a, the fancy version. Remember our RVC salt bridge was string that was soaked in potassium nitrate. Okay, so what was really going on? Well, you kind of figured out, as I told you how to do, hook it up so that you get a positive voltage or cell potential or current, has lots of names. Um, that was on your lab quest and you had alligator clips that you hooked up to your two solid surfaces and you hooked them in such a way that you got a positive cell potential well let's now look at what was really going on in the sur on those solid surfaces of the anode and the cathode so if we start by looking over here on the left hand side of the slide this was using zinc at the anode, and remember at the anode, that's where oxidation occurs. Cathode is where reduction occurs. So at the anode, remember our words, oil rig. So this was my anode. This was my cathode. So starting at the anode, in this particular example, zinc was being oxidized. Oxidation is loss of electrons. So zinc was giving up electrons. Well, how and what was going on with that? Well, we had this solid piece of zinc here and we had a zinc solution. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was. It may have been zinc sulfate. That's a very common ionic salt solution that we might use. So you have solid zinc atoms sitting here on the surface of the metal and then you had zinc two cations floating around in the zinc sulfate solution so what was going on in terms of loss of electrons sure electrons were lost and they traveled through the wire and measured that cell potential and the electrons end up over here at the cathode which we'll talk about later however starting with just the oxidation is loss at the anode. So what's happening? You have neutral zinc atoms right here on the surface of the metal. And those being neutral mean they have equal numbers of protons and electrons. Well, if zinc loses electrons, it's no longer neutral like what's on the surface of the metal. Now it's like the zinc 2 plus cation. So what happens as these neutral atoms lose or give up electrons to then go over to copper, as they lose them, they also leave the surface of the metal, as you can see the arrow here, and they go into solution as a cation. Neutral zinc versus zinc 2 plus, well, the difference is two electrons. And the difference is plenty in terms of properties and everything else as well. But that's what happens. You've got a big solid surface here of zinc, as those zinc atoms lose electrons, the electrons travel over to copper, but the zinc atoms no longer stay on the surface of the metal. They actually leave and go into solution. Now, we didn't do this, and we didn't do it long enough. However, however, if we were to weigh the metal, for instance, a piece of zinc, let's say we let this process, this reaction, go on for several hours, you could weigh the piece of zinc before and after, and it would actually have a different mass. Same thing with the solution. The solution would increase in mass as it gained those zinc ions. However, we have some stuff going on with the salt bridge too that kind of evens that out. So I like to just talk about the solid surfaces. And then over here on this side of the <clears throat> um, cell, this is again where the cathode is. Cathode is where reduction occurs. Reduction is gain of electrons. So as those electrons traveled through the wire and through the alligator clip and over to the um, cathode portion of the cell, electrons are being gained. And so let's look at this kind of blown up what's happening here. So electrons come through and the copper atoms that are neutral say, hey, we're, we're neutral. We're good. We're not looking to become anions. No, instead it's the copper two plus cations that are floating around in the solution of copper sulfate that say, hey, 
we need those couple of electrons. We'll take those. And when you take copper 2 plus and you give it two electrons, you form copper neutral atoms. So the surface of this particular piece of metal actually increases in mass because copper atoms are formed on the surface of the metal. The copper ions are coming out of solution as they gain the electrons, and that's what's happening inside of any galvanic cell. Now, what we didn't talk about, <clears throat> the salt bridge that I've kind of screwed everything up here and you can't really see it very well. What's going on on the salt bridge? Well, salt bridges, ours, the one we did was potassium nitrate. This one was potassium chloride, but it basically just evens out the charges so that you don't, you don't have a big buildup of a cation or positive or negative charges in one side or the other. You don't want to have a charge buildup. So that's what that does. Okay. Now, what else is happening? Whoops, I've written all over here. Um, at the bottom, you can see these half reactions. We looked at those last week. Remember the half reactions? For instance, here is zinc losing electrons. This is the oxidation half reaction. And here's the reduction half reaction where copper is gaining the electrons. Those are the two half reactions that are happening at their respective locations, the cathode and the anode. This is, happens to be spontaneous. So you hook it up to a voltmeter, hook it up to a light bulb. Let's say you want to power, if you can still kind of see my light bulb here, and you get a spontaneous redox reaction where electrons transfer spontaneously and the two things are so happy that you did this that they actually give cell potential they give energy off that we can that can be converted and used to do something like power a light bulb or what's inside of a battery same kind of reaction and those batteries can power all sorts of different things these are spontaneous redox reactions all right, so here's a galvanic cell. Now, I'll be honest, this is kind of like old school when I was in college in like 1998. Um, our voltmeters were these big, massive, clunky things. So were pH meters, you know, same kind of thing. But this is what we did last week in lab, again, on a smaller scale. And again, not with this fancy salt bridge, as you can see right here, but with our piece of string. But that's actually what happened inside of our, gal our cells that you made a galvanic cell in your well plate, hooked it up with those alligator clips, and you measured and recorded a positive cell potential. Now, what is it that's being recorded? And what was that number? We call it cell potential. Um, it's the difference in electric electrical potential between the anode and the cathode. And it's got several different names. You've probably heard me use most of these already. Um, maybe not the EMF, but cell voltage, cell potential. Those are the two common ones that I use, but it's also electromotive force. I think that's used a little more maybe in a physics class. So here's that example that I just showed you between the um, reaction between the copper and the zinc. It was on the last slide. <clears throat> Here, let's say we can make those solutions that were in the beakers or the concentration of the solution that were in your cells as one molar. <clears throat> and we can do what's called a cell diagram. So this is a cell diagram. These are important. You're going to be asked and need to use these <clears throat> um, more than once. But what happens, your cell diagram, sorry, this is all kind of popping up at once, has the anode, always alphabetical, anode on the left, cathode on the right and don't forget anode means what oxidation cathode therefore means reduction and if you'll notice these um, this cell diagram it has the reactant zinc and the product zinc ion over on the left hand side remember zinc was a reactant zinc solid atoms were reactants zinc ions were the product and so they're in the same order here but instead of an arrow we draw this vertical line and then over on the left hand side copper ion is a reactant that goes first always write your reactants to the left and copper atoms are your products and that's written on the right so we took those two half reactions or if you had a complete reaction net ionic like what i have right here this guy either one or the two half reactions the cell diagram kind of divides the two shows you the two half reactions what's happening in the anode in terms of oxidation 
what's happening in the cathode in terms of reduction. And then the other thing it has right here in the middle is what's called a phase boundary. So the two vertical lines are there just to separate, okay, here's oxidation to the left, here's reduction to the right. It also, some people will say, represents the salt bridge. Either one, what's important is that you have the substances listed, the physical state they're in, solid, um, or a concentration if it's aqueous, a concentration or solid. All those things are really important in writing a cell diagram. Okay, so that brings us to standard reduction potentials. And we looked at this in lab already. So I'm going to kind of go quickly through it. Assuming you were listening and pay attention, paying attention in lab, you kind of have a little clue what's going on. So these standard reduction potentials, it's a voltage associated with the reduction reaction in an electrode where your concentration was one molar if it was an aqueous solution. If it was a gas, it was done at 1 atm. And if you remember from last lab last week, the standard table I gave you in class, things you can look up, things that are in your book, standard reduction potential tables all have hydrogen as 0.0, .0 volts. Everything was set with hydrogen as zero. So here's what's happening with hydrogen, for instance. Hydrogen's being reduced, remember? Oil rig, reduction is gain. So here's the reduction half reaction for hydrogen. Hydrogen ions, such as in maybe, let's say, HCl, has lots of protons floating around in there. Give it some electrons, and on the surface, remember last week we didn't use platinum, because, oh my gosh, we could never afford platinum at the college. But we used carbon, and we, that just gave us a solid surface where the reaction can occur, especially when we did things with halogens. So for hydrogen, we typically set it to zero. You don't have to. In lab last week, we decided we were going to, we didn't decide. The lab told us we were going to set silver equal to zero. But the typical table sets hydrogen equal to zero. And so what happens if you look at those potential tables, which we'll get to here in just a second, all of those on the standard reduction potential table have hydrogen as zero, okay? Hydrogen as zero in the reduction. And so chemists have paired hydrogen with all sorts of different compounds and hooked them up to a voltmeter like we did and recorded the cell potential. So here is zinc and hydrogen being created or creating a galvanic cell. You can see what the cell potential is. And again, we don't have the alligator clips red and black, but <clears throat> I'm telling you, showing you here, that this is the anode on the left, cathode on the right. Anode is what? Anode is where oxidation occurs, the loss of electrons. And you can see that's what's going on here in my cell diagram. Zinc neutral to zinc 2 plus. Zinc is losing two electrons. Over here on the right-hand side, when we typically look at these cells like this, this is cathode over here on the right. And cathode is where reduction occurs or gain of electrons. And if we look at the cell diagram for this, on the right-hand side, hydrogen ion becoming hydrogen neutral, well, that's gaining electrons. And that's exactly what reduction is. So that's the cell diagram, and that's what's happening. Now, if we set hydrogen equal to zero, oops, volts, but the whole thing equals 0.76 volts, guess what? By default, we can figure out what the potential for the zinc is, the zinc half reaction. Oops, sorry, I'm going to, I wrote over my slide. There are my two half reactions written out from the cell diagram. There's the overall net ionic equation, if you can see that. Okay. So there it is for the cell. And again, just like it was for Gibbs free energy, when you have, for instance, delta G naught from the last chapter, or in this ch chapter, we're talking about E cell, which is cell potential with a little degree or not sign, that's under standard conditions. And for the most part in this lecture, we're going to look at things in under standard conditions. But I'll tell you when it's not. OK, so here is the equation. Now. Your lab book had the equation a little different, and I'm going to show you another way which is similar to what the lab book had. You can do either or, but you cannot combine the two, okay? So this is what your book and a lot of the current books show in terms of what's the equation to, for the total cell potential. Well, it's the potential of the cathode minus the potential of the anode. 
I find that students hate to have to think about, okay, which one's oxidized? What is oxidation? Oh, that's anode. What's reduction? And what, oh, that's cathode. I, hate, I find students don't like to do that. And then they have to subtract and you have to do it in the right order, cathode minus anode. My method, and this matches what we did in the book last week. My handwriting's terrible with this pencil, sorry guys. Is simply the cell potential equals the reduction half reaction potential plus the oxidation potential half reaction cell potential. And you can just add them together. It doesn't matter which one you put first when you're adding them. Now, I'll show you when we get the table out how you know, you know what to do with what. <clears throat> but for right now, I'll show you, you know, their method. So there's the phase diagram, cell diagram, excuse me. So what is happening at the cathode? Cathode is reduction minus the anode. Anode is oxidation. And therefore, if the total cell is 0.76, hydrogen we're setting to zero. Again, that's hydrogen is typically zero in the tables that are given. They set hydrogen, had to pick something as a comparison or a reference point. Typically it's hydrogen. In your lab from last week, you're going to set, you set silver equal to zero and figured out the numbers. And then on page two of your data, like analysis, you were, I'm going to compare those to hydrogen. When hydrogen is zero, how do they differ? The order should still be the same in terms of who's the strongest to who's the weakest, but the numbers are going to vary a little bit. Okay, anyways, I digress. So if reduction is hydrogen, and that's zero because we're going to set it to zero, then we can figure out what the unknown here, this was oxidation, which was zinc. And so when you set it up and solve, the cell potential with respect to the um, zinc half reaction is negative 0.76. And that's where the numbers came from on the table as well. All right, here's hydrogen with copper. Same thing. Hooked it up, put the black and the red. Again, you can't see what's black and what's red in terms of alligator clips, but they hooked it up in such a way that they got a positive overall cell potential. Okay, now, assuming that you know that this is, again, the anode and this is cathode, so you would know red versus black. If you know that, you know in this particular pairing, unlike the last one, hydrogen and copper, hydrogen's gonna be the one where oxidation is occurring, or hydrogen is going to be the one that's losing electrons, and the cathode is where reduction is occurring, which means copper is gaining. So again, thinking and putting it all together, zinc versus hydrogen, who's stronger? Well, who was taking the electrons when I had those two together? Hydrogen was. But when I put copper versus hydrogen, such as in here, who is stronger? Well, copper is stronger. So if we had to rank them in terms of strength, like I talked about in lab last week, copper would be the strongest at stealing or taking electrons, being reduced, then hydrogen, and then zinc. That would be the order. Anyways, we're not doing that right now, um, but just as a comparison and, and to explain why in this particular galvanic cell, hydrogen was on the left for the anode <clears throat> and copper on the right. Again, it's just based on if you had the black and the red alligator clips, which one went where. All right, so here's the phase diagram for this one. And you'll notice platinum is listed. You'll notice platinum is typically listed just simply because, hey, that's the, that's the electrode. That's where it's going to happen. It's not part of the reaction itself. It just provides that solid surface for the exchange of electrons to occur. There's our half reaction happening at the anode where hydrogen is losing electrons because when you pair copper and hydrogen, just based on this setup and these results, copper is stronger. Copper is at the cathode being reduced or gaining the electrons. And then overall, there's our overall net ionic equation. All right, and sorry, I don't think, let me see if I can, uh, I can't quite erase that, sorry guys. Um, the cell potential, then that's measured equals, let's see if I can fix this a little. Oh, hang on. Let me do it a different color. The cell potential equals the cathode potential minus the anode potential. That's their method. Or again, my method is just oxidation plus reduction. Put them together and that gets your cell. So what's going on here? The cell is 0 0.34 volts. 
We know again hydrogen is zero. Hydrogen's at the anode, so 0, 0.0. What minus zero is 0 0.34? Well, the cell potential for copper is a positive 0 0.34 volts. And I should have just left that alone, I guess, sorry. All right, so here's a table similar to what I gave you, um, what now, a week or two ago in class? And you'll see a couple of things about this. And we've talked about this already a little bit. But notice the numbers here on the left. So the largest positive numbers are on the top. The largest negatives are on bottom. And that hydrogen, as I talked about, hydrogen is zero. In this particular table, you're going to make a table from your lab with silver as zero. <clears throat> Nonetheless, so here's what's going on here. The higher up on this reduction table, okay, so well, let's talk about that. Reduction table. Notice all of these half reactions. These are all half reactions where electrons are being gained. They're reduction potentials. I could just as easily over here write a standard oxidation potential table, and I would just flip all these reactions over. We're showing they're losing. I don't need to do that. So we typically just look at reduction potentials. So again, in comparison then of strength, in terms of, think about what reduction is, gaining electrons, the guys higher on the table are stronger at taking electrons away from guys lower on the table. Now, you might look at something like, like this guy here with ozone, and protons, you're going, why, why is that one so crazy? Well, think back to the first half of the lecture when we balance those redox reactions. And sometimes we actually have to use the protons or the oxygens to be involved in and helping us transfer electrons. So, so that's it. Don't panic. Um, you know, some, most of them are like the fluorine um, or the fluoride fluorine becoming fluoride ions, where it's simply the elements left and right and the electrons. But there are several that have the protons as well mixed in. And again, that's just back to those were needed to actually for the balancing of the redox. You don't have to worry about that, okay? Just find what you need on the table. So for instance, last week, we did iron three to iron two. <clears throat> now you will see on a lot of these tables that you may have substances that are listed. It looks like they're listed more than once. For instance, there's iron three going to iron two, iron three being reduced or gaining an electron. But down here is iron two as well. well what in the world? Well, like always, you have to be really careful. And when you read these tables and you're looking for specific half reactions, you need to know, am I looking for iron two becoming neutral iron? Or am I looking for iron three and iron two? Make sure you pull exactly what you're you know, what you're needing. Okay, so the E naught is written for the, for, is for the reaction as written. The more positive the potential, the greater the tendency for the substance to be reduced. That's just up here. The higher it is up here, the stronger it is, the greater the tendency that these substances at the top will be the ones stealing electrons. The half cell reactions are reversible. That's what I was talking about right here. These are all reductions, just to keep things simple and, and straightforward. All you have to do is flip the reactions over and you have the oxidation half reactions. Now, if you're going to flip the equations or the reactions, you'd also then have to flip the sign. And I'll show you what that means in just a second. <clears throat> That's what that says there. Changing the stoichiometric, sto yeah, stoichiometric coefficients of a half cell does not change the value of E. What in the world does that mean? Well, let's just say your half reaction was three iron threes becoming three iron twos plus three electrons, you would not, would not take the cell potential, this guy here, 0.77, and multiply it by three. You wouldn't do that. And so think about like batteries, for instance. Again, as I talked about last week, different batteries have different reactions going on between them, depending on what cell potential is needed. For instance, a AAA battery, typically power something different than a 9-volt battery. 9 volts batteries are giving off 9 volts of cell potential. Triple A's are like, I, th I think it's between 1 and 2 volts off the top of my head. Anyways, what's going on inside the battery and the, the voltage is not based on, hey, let me just increase the amount I have because I'll, I'll like triple the voltage. A 9-volt battery has a completely different reaction happening to get the 9 volts. 
In fact, a 9-volt battery has <clears throat> not even things that are on this particular chart because it would be the difference between the two. And on this particular table, uh, let me see, whoops, oops. Oh, on that particular table, I think the greatest difference would, is like 5 volts. So, anyways, okay, let's start looking at some problems. Predict what would happen if molecular bromine is added to a solution containing sodium chloride and sodium iodine. So this is two separate problems. Wants to know... If we added Br2 to sodium chloride, what would happen? And if we added Br2 to sodium iodine, what would happen? Okay, well, so here's the deal. Molecular bromine is Br2. I can't go back. I don't know. Let me see if I can go back in the slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going back to this slide, and sorry for the scribble. I'm trying to find, and let me do a different color, um, molecular bromine. Now, of course, not everything is on every chart. So Br2 plus two electrons, the half reaction where molecular bromine forms bromide ions has a potential of 1.70 volts. That's the reduction potential. Now, the question's asking, if I mix that with sodium chloride and sodium iodine, what's going to happen? Well, sodium's just a spectator, right? Er <clears throat> so let's look at a comparison to the Cl2 and the I2. So sodium's a cation, right? Sodium's a cation. And it starts with sodium chloride in the one solution, and it's with sodium iodine in the other. And really the question is, is the bromide ion going to substitute for chloride or iodine? Oh, okay, how, how do we figure that out? Well, first, again, we've got to find all three on the table. So let me find chlorine going to chloride. Here's iodine. Oops. So the I2 plus two electrons forming. Whoops forming 2i minus has a potential of positive 0.53 volts. And the Cl2 is a little higher up here with a positive 1.36 volts. So again, back to our question, we have two separate things going on. We want to know, will sodium chloride plus Br2, not balanced, don't worry about that right now, will I have a single displacement? Will I form sodium bromide and chlorine all by itself? Well, think about what's going on here. Right now I have, again, sodium's my spectator. I have chloride ions becoming molecular chlorine. And I have molecular bromine becoming bromide. So the question for you is, which one is gaining, which one is losing? Well, because chloride Chlorine starts out as chloride on the left-hand side as a reactant, but it would be, have to become chlor chlorine, molecular chlorine all by itself on the product side. That would mean it's losing, it's subtracting, it's losing electrons. And what is that, oxidation or reduction? Right, it's oxidation. And then what would happen with bromine? Well, if I start with mixing it with molecular bromine and it becomes bromide, of course, the opposite is true, it's gaining. So in this first question, will this single displacement, replacement, whatever you want to call it, will it happen? Well, the question is, who's stronger, bromine or chlorine? Well, if you go back to this table, remember the higher up they are, the stronger they are. So chlorine sits right here. Chlorine is going to steal electrons, or it's stronger than bromine. Okay. How does that compare to this problem? Well, in the problem here, if this were to happen, the single replacement, this is saying that chlorine would give up electrons, lose electrons to bromine, right? See my half reactions right here? Chlorine is gaining, elect or excuse me, chlorine is losing electrons, being oxidized. Bromine is gaining them, becoming bromide. That's reduction. Well, what did we say in the table here on the left? Chlorine is stronger than bromine. Chlorine is going to take electrons when paired with bromine. So this is not going to happen. Chlorine is not going to take the electrons from bromine. In fact, just the opposite, right? Just the opposite. Chlor I mean, excuse me, chlorine is going to take them. It's not going to give them away. To do this single replacement, 
chlorine would have to, for this to work, looking at the equation, looking at the balanced equation and then separating it into the net ionics, the chloride ion would be giving up electrons. And when you mix that stuff with bromine, not going to happen. Chlorine is stronger, not going to happen. So this is a no reaction. Now, my other equation, let's see if I can get another color in here, or the other part of this problem was, okay, what if you have sodium iodide? and molecular bromine. Will you get a reaction? Well, again, what's my uh, equation going to be? Sorry, I can't. Uh, let me see if I can erase some of this and give myself a little more room here. Sorry, guys. Hang on. I'm using a new program. I'm not as familiar with it. Okay. So part two of that same question, will I have a single replacement here? Will sodium hook up with bromide ion, leaving iodine all by itself? That's part two of the question. Well, again, sodium spectator. So the question is, will I minus plus Br2 form Br minus plus I2? Now, if we think of what, what's going on <clears throat> in terms of the electrons, I minus, meaning it has extra electrons, becomes I2. And even if you want to think about it balanced, if you need to think about it as a balanced reaction, that's fine. There'd be a two here and a two here. So this would be a 2. But either way, you've got a negative iodine, which means excess electrons, becoming neutral. So it's losing electrons, giving them up. And you have Br2 becoming Br-, minus, which means it's gaining electrons, right? <clears throat> so the question is now, in this part 2 of this question, who's stronger, iodine or bromine? Well, we found bromine here, iodine here. Bromine is higher on the reduction potential table. That means bromine is stronger. And when you pit them against each other, bromine's going to take the electrons, steal them, gain them, whatever, however you want to think about it. Iodine's going to give them up. Oh, hey, wait, that's exactly what's happening here. Bromine is gaining them. Iodine is losing them. So in my problem, go back to my other slide here, whoops. In my, whoops, oh, sorry guys, hang on. In my problem then, yes, this will happen. The previous one does not. Now, if you read through these slides carefully, you'll see that this particular textbook talks about a diagonal rule. I don't teach the diagonal rule. I think it's too confusing. I simply look at the reduction potential table, see who's higher, and then say, okay, I understand if this substance is higher on the reduction potential table, it's stronger and when you pit two things against each other, like iodine, iodide ion and bromine, who is stronger? That's the guy who's going to be reduced, and that's what's happening here. Bromine is stronger than iodine, so it's going to gain electrons. <clears throat> iodine is weaker, wimpier. It's going to lose electrons. And in this particular combination, this will work. Yes, you would have a reaction. If you were doing this in your test tube, you'd see evidence of a reaction. If you were trying to do the previous slide with the chlorine and the bromine, there'd be a no reaction because chlorine is stronger. Chlorine, when you pit chlorine versus bromine, chlorine's going to steal the electrons. Okay, let's look at our next problem. A galvanic cell consists of a magnesium electrode in a one molar magnesium nitrate solution and a silver electrode in a silver nitrate solution. Calculate the cell potential for this. Okay, now you'll notice a couple of things that are missing, or in fact, really one important thing that's missing. What's happening at the anode and what's happening at the cathode? Or in other words, which one's being oxidized, which one's being reduced? I'm not showing you a picture of the beakers with the cell, you know, some cell voltage up here and showing you how they're connected. I'm just saying you make this, or let's say you're predicting that you're going to make something like this. You can predict in advance what the EMF or the cell potential will be. This is what the battery makers do at the Duracell plant when they decide, okay, I want a battery that produces 9 volts of current. What do I need to put together to get that particular cell potential? Well, here I'm telling you what you're making your galvanic cell out of, magnesium and silver. Now, the question is, what's the potential going to be? Magnesium versus silver. Well, first thing we need to do whoops, is we need to go to the, sorry, my arrows, I guess, came a little off in my 
translation here. We need to go to that table that was several slides back. Let's see if I can go to that table quickly. Oops. Sorry. As I said, new program here I'm trying out from what I used to use. And I can apparently go pretty easily backwards, but not forwards. So this poor table that I have just written all over, let's see if I can squeeze out one more thing. I want to find magnesium and I want to find silver. And okay, here's magnesium down here with a cell potential of negative 2.37. And can you find silver? Can you find silver? Be careful. You might find silver chloride right here. That's not it. I'm talking about just silver. Ah, here it is. Here it is. So part one of this problem is to figure out when I make a galvanic cell with magnesium and silver, which one's going to be stronger? Well, compare the two on the table here. Higher up the stronger it is. So silver is going to be stronger, which tells me silver is going to be, this is a table of reduction potentials, silver is going to be reduced. So silver is going to be the guy who is gaining electrons. And here's that half reaction from the previous slide. I forgot, I just forgot what the voltage was, but that was from the previous slide. Therefore, this is gonna be reduced. This is what silver is gonna do, it's gonna gain. And magnesium, well, magnesium is gonna be the opposite. Magnesium is not going to gain electrons. I can't have two things both gaining. Magnesium is gonna form those aqueous ions and it's gonna give up electrons. Okay, it's gonna give them up. So step one to decide, okay, I'm making a cell with these two things. What's gonna happen? Well, anode is oxidation. Oxidation is, whoops. I just wrote this backwards, didn't I, you guys? Hang on. Arrow plus two electrons. Sorry, talking and writing. So, and again, let me clarify this. I have magnesium solid forming magnesium ions and losing the electrons. That is oxidation, and an oxidation occurs where? At the anode. So that would be this, if I was drawing the cell out, that would be my left side. And therefore, reduction is gain of electrons. Silver's gonna be the guy who gets to gain him because he's stronger, and that's happening at the cathode or the right-hand side. This is where the silver's happening. Okay, but how do we predict the cell potential? Well, this is where, again, depending on the method, you can either use the, you know, the potential minus potential, or my method is to simply go, okay, silver is being reduced. And forgive me, guys, I'm going to go back to that table again. Whoops. Ah, wish I could go faster through to the next slide. Oh. And I've gone backwards even further. Hang on, you guys. <clears throat> I can't pause this thing either, so. I'm gonna go back to where I was. This is as bad as if we were standing in the classroom, right? I gotta click through all the slides. Okay, so silver versus, silver is 0 0.80, and magnesium is negative 0.237. Now, here's my method. How do I predict cell potential? Well, silver's gonna do exactly what it says on the table. It's gonna be reduced. This is a reduction potential table. So silver is going to be the positive 0 0.80 volts. It's being reduced. It's stronger. Magnesium, way down here at the bottom, magnesium is weaker. Magnesium is not going to be reduced. It's going to be the opposite of this. It's going to be oxidized. So I had that reaction written on the previous slide flipped over. So that means I'm, just, oops, I'm going to take that positive 2.37 and flip the sign. This is reduction, it's being oxidized, so it's the opposite is happening, so I flip it and take the opposite sign, and then I take these two and add them together, and that's my cell potential. So I can predict when I make a cell between silver and magnesium like this, that the total is, what is that, you guys help me, 7, 11, 3.17 volts, 3 3.17 volts. When I make a galvanic cell between magnesium and silver, it's going to be positive 3.17. If you want to do their method, that's fine. I'll show you that here in a second. Okay, so here are the two potentials from the table. But again, they can't both do this. Right now I'm showing both gaining electrons. That isn't possible. One is gaining silver because he's stronger. He's higher on that table. Magnesium is going to be flipped around, so I'm going to flip 
the sine, and then I just add the two together. I think that's the easiest method. Okay, so here's my two half reactions coming together. Overall, that's what's going on. Didn't really ask me what was happening overall, but here's their method. Figure out what's the cathode. Cathode is reduction, anode is oxidation, and then subtract the two. Notice what happens mathematically, exactly the same as my method. So you get the same answer, whether you want to use their equation and their method or mine. Theirs, I think you have to put a little more thought into. You have to understand what an anode and a cathode is. For my method, you don't. You just have to say, okay, the half reaction matches. This half reaction matches exactly as it is on the reduction table. So I keep the, the value exactly the same, 0 0.80. Magnesium, I'm going to flip it around. So I'm going to flip the sign and make it a positive 2.37. And then simply add the two together. Sorry, my cats are going crazy playing with some toy behind me. Hopefully you guys can't hear that. All right, now let's combine all this idea and what we've been looking at in terms of spontaneity. Remember spontaneity gives free energy, um, spontaneous reactions. Well, when you made your cells last week and you hooked them up correctly and you got positive cell potential, some, some value of volts, that meant spontaneously electrons were flowing in the direction of, you know, one side to the other, and they were doing it so happy, they were so happy they did it, that you had them hooked them up that way, that they gave off an energy that could be converted into electrical energy, and that was where we measured the volts. So, here's what we learned in the last chapter, Gibbs free energy equals, I'm oh, sorry, Gibbs free energy, the delta G we learned in the last chapter, this part of it's going to be this chapter. Negative NFE. Well, what in the world? The E cell is what we just predicted. You know the two half reactions? Put them together. What's your expected cell potential? In that last one, I think it was, what was it? 3.17 volts. N, well, guess what? N is, we'll talk about these, number of moles of electrons being transferred. So one, two, three, four, always whole numbers, and F is a constant. It's Faraday's constant. Faraday studied all this exciting work, so he gets the credit. So that would be a constant you're given on the test with this particular equation. Now, let's talk real quickly the difference between these two equations. Well, again, the little degree sign here, standard conditions, under standard conditions. When my concentration is one molar, if it's an aqueous solution, when it's one ATM of pressure if it's a gas. <clears throat> All right, we can also then, here's where it came in the last chapter, delta G equals negative RT ln of K. K, your favorite thing, we still haven't gotten rid of it, equilibrium constant. And so if this is equal to delta G and this is equal to delta G, well, guess what? They're also equal to each other, if you can avoid my scribble there. <clears throat> so these two are also equal to each other. So the equilibrium constant for a reaction is equal to, or, well, is related to spontaneity, and spontaneity is also related and tied to the cell potential. All right, if we rearrange this equation here to solve for the cell potential, you can see what we get. R times T over N and F. Well, R, T, and F are constants. So we can combine those three values, since they're always the same, assuming, again, we're doing this at 25 degrees Celsius, <clears throat> which is 298 Kelvin. I can combine all this, let me keep going here, into this particular equation. So 8.314 times 298 divided by 96,500 gives me a value of 0 0.0257 volts is the only unit left, which is good because cell potential is going to be in volts. N is the number of moles, and K, again, is your equilibrium constant. K is what? The ratio of products over reactants. You can also do it based on log base 10. I think on the test I'll give you both. I mean, they pretty much work the same way. Just remember, though, when you're trying to, if let's say you're solving for K, you're going to take E to the X. If you're, and you're using that equation. If you're using the other equation, the log base 10, you're going to take 10 to the x if you're solving for k. Otherwise, if you have k, you simply hit you know, your calculator button and plug in the right one. All right, so here's a cute little diagram that shows how all these three things are connected. Equilibrium constant, Gibbs free energy, and the cell potential. All right, so let's talk about spontaneity. 
remember, electrons will flow spontaneously if you have things hooked up in the right way. You've got your red alligator clip on the right one and the black one on the you know, right one. You get a positive cell potential. I had you in the lab flip those if you weren't getting a positive value because that wasn't happening spontaneously then, those electrons flowing. So this is just kind of a summary here. If your delta G is negative, what does that mean? Spontaneous reaction. Your K is greater than one. Products are favored because K is a ratio of products to reactants. Your cell potential will be positive as well. And as I just said, products are favored. If your delta G is equal to zero, if your delta G is equal to zero, your K will be equal to one. Products and reactants are equally favored and your cell potential will be zero, will be zero. And then what if you get a positive delta G? That's non-spontaneous in the forward direction. Non-spontaneous in the forward direction. Flip it around and you'll have, you know, a good reaction. But in the forward direction, if you have a positive delta G, your K is less than one, reactants are favored. They sit over here on the left. So the left side of the reaction is favored. You'd get a negative cell potential. The cell would not be happy. Okay, you flip the leads and electrons flow in the other direction. That's good. And then there's my two equations there. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at some more problems. Calculate the equilibrium constant. So what was that? K for the following reaction, and that's all I have. How in the world do I do this? Well, if you remember just back one slide, equilibrium constant is tied to cell potential through this equation right here. Well, in fact, we can go back even one more slide and all my little scribble here. Sorry guys, I gotta work on my program. Mm. I like this one here, 0 0.0257 volts over N times the ln of K. So let's get to that. Okay, so I'm solving for K. Can you quickly look and see what is N got to be? Well, look what's happening to both of these. How many electrons are being transferred? N is a total of two, so that's gonna go here. I'm solving for K, therefore I need one more thing to be able to get this. I need the cell potential. How do we do cell potentials? Well, again, first thing, we're gonna divide the reaction into the, half, the two half reactions and understand what's happening here. So with my tin here, what's going on? Well, it's losing electrons, so oxidation. And for my two copper ions, copper is gaining electrons. It's being produced. So I'm going to go to the reduction potential table, and I'm going to pull the value in volts exactly as it is for copper because it is being reduced, and that's a reduction potential table. And for tin, well, tin's the opposite. It's being oxidized, so I'm going to flip the sign, positive or negative, whichever you could flip it to. Flip the sign because the equation's flipped and then add the two together, and I'll get my total cell potential. Again, I'm gonna show you their method, which is a little different. Here's my equation I'm gonna use. Use the table to determine, that's from the older book, but still the same table. And again, using their method, or my method should be the same, you would just flip the sign, but you should still get either way, regardless of which method you use, a total cell potential of 0.29 volts. So that's my cell potential. That's gonna go here. My N we figured out was two. Remember two electrons being transferred. So plug all the numbers in, get your natural log of K all by itself. And then on your button on your calculator where it says LN, there's also E to the X. That's always the reminder of, uh, how do I get rid of that or cancel that natural log? So E to that number gives you your equilibrium constant. It's seven times 10 to the positive nine. It's an extremely positive K value, which means, oh, my cat decided we were going to the next slide, I guess. It's a positive uh, equilibrium constant, which means products are favored, okay? The reaction's driving to the right. It also had a positive cell potential, which should tell us, allow us to predict the same thing. And although we didn't calculate Gibbs free energy, guess what we could? And it would be a negative value, spontaneous. All right, let's calculate this B 
speaking of, let's calculate the delta G for this particular reaction. Now again, my equations I showed you a little bit ago, I won't bore you with taking you all the way back again, but I showed you how Gibbs free energy is related to cell potential. Now, it's also related, remember, to K. You can go back and forth between all three of these. However, I don't have K here. I don't have K, so I can't go this direction. And even though I don't, I'm not given the cell potential, I'm given the net ionic, and so I can figure out, okay, who's gaining, who's losing, and predict, figure out what the cell potential must be, and there from cell potential, determine Gibbs free energy. So, okay, let's do this one more time. Half reaction. What's going on there? Gold is gaining how many electrons? Two times neutral, two times plus three. Six electrons. It, whoops, not gaining. It's losing six electrons. Calcium, therefore, should still be six. Three times a positive two becomes three times neutral. Yeah, it's gaining six electrons. So my calcium half reaction, calcium, each one is gaining two. So it's being, what? Reduced. So I'd pull the cell potential as exactly as it is off the table. My gold, oops, is therefore losing electrons. Oops, it's losing lots of them. So e this is the individual half reactions. My N that I'm going to use is 6, however, because if you look at the balanced equation, there's a total of 6 electrons being lost, 6 electrons being gained. But my two half reactions down here, one, as always, is exactly and should exactly match what's on the reduction potential table. So I pull the number exactly as it is. And one, as it always should be, is the opposite, because one's being oxidized as one's being reduced. And so I'm going to flip the sign, positive or negative, whatever it is, flip it the other direction, and then simply add them up. Put the two together, and you get your total cell potential. Or if you want to use their method, figure out what the anode is. Figure out what the cathode is. And cathode minus anode get you your cell potential. Either one, I like my method, I, logically it makes more sense to me, but you can use whatever you want. Once I have that cell potential and I know N, I can get my Gibbs free energy. It's pretty simple. So here's the cell potential for this particular reaction. Ooh, it's a negative. Not so good. That means off the bat right away I can predict this is going to be non-spontaneous. Didn't ask me that, but that's the cell potential. So here's my Gibbs free energy, and again, that was why I needed the N, because N is 6. F is Faraday's constant, which is 96,500 joules per volt mole. My cell potential is a negative 4.37. Multiply the three together, and I don't think it was specific as to which units it wanted, joules or kilojoules, so you know I don't care if it's not specific. Do whatever you like. But either way, moral of the story, that's the free energy. It's positive, which means reactants are favored. It's non-spontaneous, which we, and, and I did predict based on the negative cell potential. All right, now here's something crazy. All of that was based on one molar of everything. You can actually adjust the concentration of the cell to affect Gibbs free energy this like we did in the last chapter it'll also affect the cell potential it'll also affect cell potential I kind of compare this to Henderson Hasselbach do you guys remember that it was pH equals pKa plus the log of concentration base over concentration acid in your buffer this was a buffer equation and I said okay let's say you had a pKa of set 4.74 but you wanted a pH of 5.00 well, that's where this comes into oops, that's where this comes into play. You can manipulate the concentrations of acid and base. They don't have to be equal to get that little extra boost that you need to get to 5.0 as a pH instead of 4.74. Well, I kind of th think of that in this same way here. If you need a particular cell potential, you can boost it up by varying the concentration. And that was called Henderson-Hasselbach in this particular 
chapter, and the equation we're going to look at is the Nernst equation. Of course, he did it, so he gets credit for it. So we can manipulate what would be normally the cell potential under standard conditions. We can get a different cell potential by, well, our T and F are constants, so that's not going to change anything. And it's still the same reaction. You still have the same number of electrons being transferred, but we can manipulate the Q. Remember what that is? The quotient, the equilibrium quotient, which is the same thing as K. It's the ratio of products over reactants. So you're going to see here in a second we can manipulate the concentrations and get different cell potentials. Again, within reason, just like with the buffer, I couldn't go from a pKa of 4.74 to a pH of 9, but within reason you can adjust it a little bit by varying the concentrations, which, again, if you want to use log base 10 or natural log, either one is fine. All right, so let's look at one of these. Predict whether the following reaction would proceed spontaneously if we had these guys in solutions that were not one molar, but were 0.15 and 0.68. Again, that's all I've got. This is all that's given to me. I gotta figure out whether it's gonna be spontaneous. So here's the deal. I can, and I will usually start with calculating what's the cell potential under standard conditions. That's what the little degree sign here means. And so therefore, I'm going to look at the two half reactions. And I'm going to say, OK, iron is gaining electrons. Cobalt is losing electrons. Loss of electrons, that's my oxidation. Gain of electrons is my reduction. Look at the reduction potential table. Figure out what the value for iron 2 becoming neutral iron is. Put that number down exactly as it is. Go to the table and find out where copper becoming copper 2 plus. Well, you're not going to see it copper as a reactant and copper I, or copper, cobalt as a reactant and cobalt 2 as a product. No, because that's oxidation and your table is reduction. So the table will show this as a reactant becoming neutral cobalt because the table is full of reductions showing gains. But it's still there. Find the reaction, just flip it around. So I'd flip the sign for the cobalt, and then I would just add the two together. That would get me what the standard, if I was doing this at one molar and one molar solutions, that would get me what the cell potential would be. Now, <clears throat> in terms of my Q, let's just talk about this right now since I've got some room on the screen. Q is products over reactants, right? And remember, Q or K, we never include solids. So those two guys are not included. In fact, let me be even a little more. They're not included. So my product is my cobalt 2 ion concentration, because that's the product side, and my reactant is the iron 2 ion concentration. Well, that's what this and this are. So Q is going to equal 0 0.15 over 0 0.68. There's my Q. My cell potential under standard conditions I got from the table. Those are the two things that I need. Oh, wait, I need one more thing. Even though it's all scribbled over, can you guys see how many electrons are being transferred? Cobalt's going from neutral to 2 plus. Well, two electrons. So once I plug that in my calculator, I get a value for Q. My N is equal to 2, and my cell potential under standard conditions I got once I look at the table. All right, here's the cell potential. Ooh, it's negative. So, okay, so normally under one molar, one molar conditions, this is going to be non-spontaneous. Remember, think about that 9-volt battery. It's not a negative 9 volts. It's positive. It spontaneously happens and produces 9 volts of cell potential, but it's positive. This is non-spontaneous. Now, it's kind of small, so maybe the concentrations are varied enough that I can force it to be a spontaneous process. All right, so here's my equation. Remember, N we said was 2. The Q are my concentrations, products over reactants, and I determined that just based on that original equation where I saw cobalt ion sitting on the product side. I saw iron ion sitting on the reactant side. Do the math, and well, so it varied a little bit from 0.16 down to negative, excuse me, negative 0.16 to negative 0.14, getting closer to zero, but now those concentrations don't vary enough to force it into a positive potential, so it's not spontaneous. 
All right, let's look at this guy here. Consider the galvanic, shown, bleh, galvanic cell shown below. In a certain experiment, the EMF is found to be 0.54. <clears throat> Suppose that here's your concentration zinc, here's your pressure, because it's a gas, of hydrogen. Calculate the concentration of H+. Plus. And you go, what in the world is going on? Okay, so a couple of things, lots of things to talk about right here. First of all, the cell potential in a particular cell is 0.54 volts. The potential down here when I'm at one molar, one, excuse me, one ATM, one molar, one molar, that's standard conditions. And notice it's right here. So under standard conditions, that's the cell potential. They did a different mixture. They varied. This is one molar and one ATM, but what we're going to find is the hydrogen ion concentration is going to vary, and therefore cell potential no longer is 0.76. In this one, it's 0.54. Okay, before we get into everything, let's talk about a couple of things. So <clears throat> anode, cathode, right? And so at the anode, what's happening? Anode is oxidation. Oxidation is loss of electrons. So zinc is becoming zinc ion, losing electrons. And over here on the left-hand side, protons are gaining electrons, becoming hydrogen. In fact, 2 to balance it, 2, 2. So my N is 2 right? Looking at the half reactions. And then why did I do all this? Well, a couple of reasons. <clears throat> My Q products over reactants, when I put these two reactions together, my products, zinc ion concentration, pressure, because H2 is a gas in its elemental state, gas, Reactant, well, zinc is solid, so that's not considered, and we don't consider electrons when we write the coefficient. So the, other re the only reactant that's left is concentration, because hydrogen ion coming from the HCl, that's a, um, aqueous. But don't forget it's squared, because I had a 2 here. It's not just products over reactants, guys. Remember, it's raised to any coefficient. Most of the time, it's 1. Most of the things we've looked at in the last few chapters have been 1. But here you'll find, especially with these diatomics, it's not always 1. So this is my Q equation. Whoops. Okay, the Q expression. Now, the problem itself gives me this. I got that as 1 molar. This is 1 atm. And before you ask... Yes, you can combine aqueous concentrations and pressures. That's kind of nice. It works out well. So when I work all this out, I have my two cell potentials. Under standard conditions, what's happening here? Or if you want to work out the half reactions for zinc and hydrogen, you can figure out what the cell potential would be. It would be 0.76. And then they told us that under these weird conditions, it's actually point, I shouldn't say weird, but different conditions, it's 0.54. So I've done something to one of these things to affect the, the cell potential. Zinc and, and the zinc ion concentration and the pressure of hydrogen, those are standard conditions, one molar, one atm. So therefore, what we're going to see in a minute here, it's the concentration of the protons that must be different, meaning not one molar, and that's what varies the cell potential. So isn't that amazing? <clears throat> of the three things I can really affect, concentration of zinc ion, pressure of hydrogen, or pressure or, or um, concentration of the acid, the protons, I only have to change one of them, and I get a different cell potential. And I would say this is a fairly drastic difference. Okay, so here's what's going on. That's what I just showed you. Those are the two half reactions written together, products reactants. So that helps us with our Q expression. And again, the N is 2. You can follow even just the zinc through and see two moles of electrons are being transferred. <clears throat> All right, I would do this in two steps, guys. That's just me. I would step one, I would use this equation, and I'd solve for Q. Then in step two, I'd set up the Q, you know, the concentration whoops, of zinc ion times the concentration of, or excuse me, times the pressure of hydrogen, those were my products, over my concentration of protons squared. <clears throat> I would do it in two separate steps. I just think this kind of gets hairy. But some of you are really good with math, and you might be able to do this in one step. 
Either way, we're solving for one piece of Q, not the, not the whole thing. Um, so you can do it in one step if you want. And if you do it right, again, it won't matter. You'll get, the, you'll get the right answer. So again, that's just me. I would set up and solve for Q and then work out the Q expression. This is combined it all. Again, this is one molar given in the problem, one ATM pressure. We're solving for the H plus concentration from the hydrochloric acid. And you can see what it works out to be. All right, so then that leads us to these things called concentration cells. <clears throat> you can also, this is real crazy, you can use two of the same things, <coughs> excuse me, but vary their concentrations and get a cell potential. Now you're going to see it's not a very big potential, but it's still potential. It'll power a battery or a light bulb. So for instance, what do I mean by two of the same thing? Check this out. Anode, cathode. Both have zinc. How in the world is that possible? I thought zinc had the same strength. Well, yeah, it's zinc. Zinc has the same strength. However, if you vary the concentrations, you can get a little bit of cell potential. It is kind of crazy. Now, how do we know which one's anode and which one's cathode if they're both the same thing? Well, anode is always where the more dilute is. <clears throat> cathode is more concentrated. So again, anode is oxidation, oxidation is loss. So that makes sense. The weaker solution is gonna lose. The more concentrated is the stronger solution. It's gonna gain electrons. So there are my two half reactions. Again, they, they match. <clears throat> and what are, you, what are you left with? Two different concentrations, reactant versus product. So for my Nernst equation, guess what? This is going to be zero because if you pull the value for the reduction potential from the reduction potential table, you get some number in volts for zinc. It's reduced, so you write it exactly as it is. For oxidation, you switch the sign, but the same number of volts, you add the two together, you're adding opposites, it will cancel. So this is always going to be zero. Under standard conditions, standard state cell potential is going to be zero. So you're New potential is going to be all be based on this half of the equation right there. And again, your dilute's always going to be a product. Reactant's always going to be the more concentrated. And you've got to figure out N. N is 2 here. Plug it in and solve. <clears throat> and again, I told you it was tiny, but you're still generating a cell potential by using anode and cathode with the same thing, same element, zinc here. Get a little bit of a cell potential. All right, and you guys, last couple of things, and I'm not going to test you on this, um, but I want to show you, this probably looks familiar, right? The copper top. Batteries, as I've said several times now, different batteries contain different substances, have different redox reactions happening. They all, however, have the same components. They have an anode, they have a cathode, they have a transfer of electrons happening. And the difference in potential between the substances being used is what gives you the different voltages that are listed on batteries or cell potentials or EMFs or whatever you want to call it. This is a dry cell battery, a Lichetli, I don't know how to say it, um, but I'll leave that. It's the dry cell battery. That's like your copper top. And again, you've got two half reactions happening, a little more involved at the cathode, but regardless, transfer of electrons happening generates a cell potential. This is, for instance, like a hearing aid battery, cathode, anode. This is a mercury battery. And guess what? It's got mercury in it. That's why we call it a mercury battery. But again, same idea, anode, cathode. Anode is where oxidation occurs. Oxidation is loss. Here, we had to include the hydroxide and the hydrogen for it to all make sense. Think back to the first half of the lecture on that. And then down here, the mercury is what's happening at the cathode. Mercury oxide becoming mercury. Cathode is reduction, reduction is gain. Car battery, lead storage battery, again, cathode, anode. You've got electrons being transferred. <clears throat> a whole lot more EMF generated from one of these guys than let's say a little hearing aid battery. But still, different. we need different batteries for all different things, even to power our cars. All different reactions a solid state lithium battery, anode, cathode, are you getting tired of me talking yet? <clears throat> Transfer of electrons. 
Fuel cells, this is what some people think our cars are gonna to go to eventually. Fuel cells, an electrochemical cell, requires a continuous supply of reactants to keep functioning. So, so that should be the other thing I should tell you. These batteries, why do batteries die? Well, they die because they, re they run out of reactants. One, two, both of them, they run out of stuff. Just like if you did a reaction in a beaker in a lab, it eventually will stop. You'll use everything up. Um, unless you're looking at a reversible reaction, and that's not what we're talking about here. <clears throat> but fuel cells need that constant supply of reactant to keep functioning. And what's going on here? Hydrogen and oxygen being combined and generates a good amount of energy. Almost a little dangerous, I think, for some for cars to use. But then you'd also have to have hydrogen gas and oxygen gas in your garage or inside your car. And well that poses kind of some dangers too. So I don't I think while it gives off liquid water, which is great for the environment, there's still a lot we need to work on in terms of the fuel cell cars. But I do have some hope that we may see them in use one day. Corrosion, fancy word for rusting. Corrosion is actually a redox reaction, an electrochemical process. You actually have an anode where ox or electrons are being lost and a cathode where they're being gained through the reaction. Oxygen from the air combining with the protons <clears throat> making water. How crazy is that? Because where's all that coming from? Water droplets. And at the anode, we have different metals. This is showing iron. If you've looked at our building, we have copper on the roof. We have copper siding on parts of the wall, on parts of the building, two of the thing, east and west side of it. Um, but the copper is rusting. They didn't put a protective coating on it. They wanted the copper sheeting to rust. And so you could just, you know, replace this with copper. Copper plus water and oxygen in the air. Over time, it's rusting on the surface of the metal. All right, all that, this whole chapter, we've talked about these organic cells and chemical reactions that are producing electrical energy or energy that can be converted into electrical energy to power devices, for instance, power lights generate current. Well, electrolysis is the opposite. Electrolysis is the process where electrical energy is required or needed to produce a non-spontaneous chemical reaction. Um, if you've ever had Professor Norm Dean or seen, let's say, a YouTube video on electrolysis, where, for instance, water is split into hydrogen and oxygen gas, or maybe you've seen it for molten sodium chloride, what's going on there? This doesn't happen spontaneously. These are non-spontaneous reactions. Water does not just spontaneously on its own, even if you boil it, it just changes the state. Water doesn't spontaneously split into hydrogen and oxygen gas. Doesn't happen. But if you apply energy, tons and tons of electrical energy, like you need a car battery to do it, it will happen. You can force a non-spontaneous reaction to happen. Here's what's going on with the um, sodium chloride. <clears throat> if you get it liquid hot, uh, sodium chloride, you can force the oxidation reduction to occur. Otherwise, it doesn't really want to happen. Here it is for water. Don't try this at home. Um, but you can see what's going on. There's an anode and a cathode. The battery in this instance, though, is, is applying electrical energy because it doesn't want to have it on its own. This is actually a picture of what it looks like. You can kind of see the battery over here, and my little alligator clips, all that good stuff. And it's just in hydrogen and oxygen gas. Even, they try not to do this anymore, um, but they used to be dentists. And guess what would happen? They were seeing people with sparks, and they were actually generating current between the two as the electrons were transferred. Not a good idea. I don't. 